بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ثم أما بعد so, الحمد لله أحيانا الله ولو ليوم آخر الله سبحانه وتعالى has facilitated for us to be together once again <coughs> and to continue to read and benefit from the timeless principles gleaned from the words of one of the great ulama and awliya and renewers of this ummah, of this tradition, namely Sayyidi Muhyiddin Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, radiallahu anhu, al-Qadah, al-Kitab al-Musamma, bil-Fatih al-Rabbani, wal-Fayyidu al-Rahmani, sublime revelation, and the divine merciful outpourings. So we have reached the 48th discourse. So we'll begin to read from the top. قال الشيخ رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من تزين للناس بما يحبون وبارز الله بما يكره لقي الله عز وجل وهو عليه غضبان ثم قال الشيخ اسمعوا كلام النبوة يا منافقون يا بعي الآخرة بالدنيا يا بعي الحق عز وجل بالخلق يا بعي ما يبقى بما يفنى خسرت تجارتكم وذهبت رؤوس أموالكم ويلكم أنتم متعرضون لمقت الله عز وجل وسخته لأن من تزين للناس بما ليس فيه مقته الله عز وجل زين ظاهرك بأداب الشرع وباطنك بإخراج الخلق أو زين ظاهرك بأداب الشرع وباطنك بإخراج الخلق من رد أبوابهم أفنهم من حيث قلبك حتى كأنهم لم يخلقوا لا ترى على أيديهم ضرا ولا نفعا قد اشتغلت بزينة القلب وتركت زينة القلب زينة القلب بالتوحيد والإخلاص والثقة بالله عز وجل وبذكره ونسيان غيره So he says, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, if someone dresses up to please other people, the word says, Man tazayyana, so it doesn't mean necessarily as in clothing, but adorns, let's say, adorns oneself to please other people, but behaves offensively towards Allah. When he meets Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, it will be to find that he has incurred his wrath. Hear the words of prophecy, O hypocrites, O you who trade the hereafter for this world. O you who trade the Lord of Truth for creatures. O you who trade what is lasting for that which must pass away. Your trading will result in loss and your capital goods will disappear. Alas for you, you are incurring the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his displeasure because when someone puts on an empty show for the sake of people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased with him or he says you're disgusted with him. You must adorn your outer, your zahir, with the good matters of the shara the sacred law, and your inner, the batin, by expelling creatures from it. You must shut them out and let them cease to exist as far as your heart is concerned, as if they had never been created. Do not regard them as having any power to cause harm or benefit. You have been preoccupied with the adornment of the outer form, the qalib, and have neglected the adornment of the heart, namely al-qalb. The way to adorn the heart is through the affirmation of unity, al-tawheed, Sincerity, ikhlas, and trust, thiqa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and through remembrance, dhikr of him, and forgetfulness of everything other than him. Jesus is reported, obviously, having said, a righteous deed is one that is done without wishing to be praised for it. Al-Amal al-Salih wa al-Ladhi la yuhibbu an yuhmadu alayhi. Typo here, yuhmadu, yuhmadu alayhi. So we've seen this... Um, We've seen this theme before from the Sheikh, uh, namely that ma'rifa, uh, knowledge of God, is within reach. And the thing that keeps us perhaps held back and away from it is our longing and our hanging our hopes and dreams 
and validation and approval on al-khalq, on what people think and what people say. And the problem with that is people can only see the zahir, they can only see the outer. And since we're aware that people can only see that, then people tend to spend more time, more mental energy, more spiritual energy on adorning, as he said, the zin al-zahir, on adorning the outside. If we felt that people can see our inside, then we would probably be spending much time, or unfor you know, not unfortunately, but it would be likely we would spend more time on sincerity and ikhlas. You know, can you imagine if people could see your thoughts and could see what's in your heart and could see what you are thinking? Um, you know, we, we might actually quarantine ourselves. We won't meet anybody because that would be too much of a burden uh, to bear. But be that as may, out of Allah's mercy and his sitr and his concealing of our faults, uh, these things are not apparent to people, at least not to most people. And uh, as a result, we tend to focus on, on the outer part. Now, of course, we say that al-zahir unwain al-batin. And we've heard that phrase before. The, the outer is a uh, kind of an address or a foreshadower or a teller, let's say, of that which is in the, the batin. So if someone is illumined spiritually from the inside, the batin, that tends to show on the outside. And, and it's not something that... Um, it will be necessarily picked up by all, but it will be picked up and noticed by people who are uh, have a little bit of that nur themselves. For you know, how could the Quraysh be so blind to the nur of the Prophet Sallallahu Even his own family members, even Abu Lahab, or his own uncle, and others like Abu Jahl, and for a long time Abu Sufyan. Uh, how could they be blind to that? We 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 can't imagine that. How can they not see that? But. If, if you're inside, your batin, your spiritual sir, as he says, the innermost being and your ruh is, is devoid of that type of at least basic tawheed, right? Affirming the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, then you will actually tend to see people uh, in the worst light and because it's a reflection of what's actually going on inside you. And we discussed this concept before. Al-mu'minu uh, mir'atul mu'min. The believer is the mirror image of the believer. So if you see them as conniving and as jealous and as envious and as uh, uh, duplicious and all these sorts of things, then chances are you have a little bit of that in yourself also. And so that's why you're you're quick uh, to accuse. You're quick to judge. You are quick to condemn. And uh, we should have husnathan, we should have a good opinion. And even if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does allow you to see or what you perceive to see the inner disposition of somebody, and he does allow that for some of his servants, some of his grateful servants, uh, that is done so that you may be in a position to affect and be a tool of Allah's work. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at such people, not with the judgmental eye, but with the eye of rahmah, with the eye of mercy. And so we too should look at people in that way, bil rahmah, or bil afu, right? With, with pardoning them and being merciful, uh, even though they may be in that situation that you think they're in, even though they may have issues with their iman or sinning or things like that, that we're not negating that. But that doesn't mean that we take an opportunity to judge them, rather we should have compassion for them and try to help them any which way we can out of that situation. You know, one of my favorite uh, akhbar that uh, is uh, narrated about Sayyid ibn Musayyib, who uh, is often referred to as Sayyid al-Tabi'een. So he was from the generation right after the Prophet Muhammad, so after the companions, radiallahu anhu. And he was asked for a fatwa about someone who uh, a public drunkard, someone who's found drunk in the streets, uh, you know, intoxicated, inebriated, walking around, uh, public nuisance. Should we turn him into the police? Should we report him to the authorities? Uh, expose him, you know, make sure he gets his punishment. And he said, no. 
he said we should uh, cover him, conceal him, conceal his mistake, uh, right? don't, don't expose him. Uh, such a person has made a mistake, and so their mistake should be concealed, not to be publicly humiliated. And so um, before we can conceal people's mistakes outwardly, we should conceal them inwardly. And the concealment of it inwardly is to still maintain a good opinion of them. And maintaining a good opinion of them doesn't mean that you're ignoring the things that they did wrong and, and negating those things, but you are still looking at their essence and their essence of humanity. So you may despise and dislike that which the Sharia despises and dislikes, and you would not be a proper believer if you didn't do that. Right? We're not saying condone people's actions, condone people's wrongdoing, but uh, do not let their wrongdoing define them for all of eternity, in, in the sense that once a thief, always a thief, um, once a racist, always a racist, once uh, uh, an adulterer, always an adulterer. That's not actually how the Sharia looks at it. There are paths of redemption. And sometimes these paths of redemption can be uh, public and outward. So in the case of people who, who've had uh, a type of criminal had punishment applied to them, uh, it's considered by many of the ulama that that's an expiation for what they've done. And now they, they're supposed to move on and people aren't supposed to look like them like that anymore. Or sometimes, and or it could be also an expiation of the inward. So if they've made the tawbah, um, then that tawbah, then that repentance is supposed to clear the slate, as it were. And even the Prophet said uh, to uh, Ma'az, one person, he had to apply the punishment for adultery too. And someone, you know, said he's accursed and malarun. He said, "Don't say that about him. If his tawbah, his repentance, was distributed to." All of the people of Medina, it would have been enough for all of them. So despite that he made a big, and what was that, a, a public mistake and a public reckoning for it, uh, he said his tawbah was true. And so that means he's, uh, uh, inshallah, a dweller of paradise. You can gather that from what the Prophet said about him. So we don't know. Even if we see someone doing something inwardly, and let's say it happened outwardly, and it happened two days ago, they can be completely different today. They could have repented from that, and they could have moved on already, and Allah SWT could have had them move on already. And you're still thinking about what they did yesterday, and you know what, how, what type of punishment that you're thinking about, and what type of come up upends they should get, and you know you're thinking they should get their karma, and you know all that sort of thing. And those those sentiments. Uh, make a prison out of your heart and they keep you down and they keep you a prisoner to your own and it's a type of uh, nafsaniya it's a type of shahwa nafsiya right it is a type of uh, passion of the appetite of soul right to see you know misfortune befall those who you consider to be your adversaries and sometimes it takes the form of you may not even know the person but uh, they did something maybe you used to do or you did at one point and that even kind of fuels your ire even more. And you want to see them uh, taken to task on it because it's actually about you despise that thing within yourself. And then when you see it in somebody else, um, you know, we tend to uh, uh, tend to want to expunge it as well as we hope it was expunged from us. And so it's kind of, it's intricate and it's hard work. Uh, we're not saying it's not to kind of be careful about your thoughts and about your you know, your whims and your caprice and what's what's being fueled by nafs and what's being fueled by ego and what can actually be a pure sentiment and what can be something that Allah SWT inspires you to do. And that's why we always have the gates that we talked about. Quran and Sunnah, the Sharia, take you through that first. So we know ghiba, namima, it's haram. So to talk about someone behind the back, even if it's true, it's not right. Uh, and even to talk about them. And I would say, the vast majority of what we consider to be mere ghiba is probably actually namima. Namima is to say something untrue about them. That's not true about them, but we tend to embellish a little bit. So we might have heard part of the story, and then we, um, you know, kind of take it to the other extreme and, and we add stuff to it. And then when adding stuff to it, as the story goes from one person to the next and becomes embellished, then you wind up really slandering the person, which is basically what namima is. Uh, and that's much worse than than just uh, riba, uh, just talking about them or backbiting, uh, saying something that they would dislike if they were in your presence with you, 
right then and there. And so uh, that's why the, the Salaf, uh, many of them, they said we can count the number of words we say in a day. The less you say, uh, the less that you'll be held accountable for. The more you say, then the more your hisab, right, your reckoning might be because you're going to be asked, well, you said this about this person and that about that person. And was that actually true? And what were you thinking when you said that? And that's why man kana yu'min billahi wal yawmil akhir, yani emphatic beginning. If you truly believe in Allah and the last day, you know, in other words, the last day is symbolic of the reckoning or indicative of the reckoning and hisab. If you truly believe in that, as the Prophet said, فَلْيَكُنْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَصْمُتْ Let them say something good or let them be silent. And uh, many of the Sufi uh, mashayikh, they even, like Zavruq and others, they delved into this even more and they they sought to and they cut off the paths of Ghiba and Namima right from the source. And, you know, they know how nafsu khalda'a, so they would say, you know, if you go up to somebody and you say, oh, how's uh, Fulan, you know, what's going on with them? And you know that there's a qissa. You know that there's like a story going on. Something happened and you're just fishing, right? You're not really interested to say, how is Fulan? Uh, you know already what happened, but you're saying, or you say something like, oh, you know what happened with, uh, you know, so-and-so, miskeen, that thing, you know, when I took a get a, you know, poor person, you know, that thing that happened to him, you know, not his fault, but, you know, and then you open the conversation up and then somehow you think you're justified because you, outwardly you're pitying them or, or there's ishfaq or you're trying to be compassionate with them, but inwardly there's still this, you know, uh, nashwa, let's call it, there's tarabba. You know, we don't, I don't have any proper words in English to describe it, the you know, uh, kind of happiness or kind of egoistic uh, satisfaction, perhaps I would say, with uh, putting others down because it elevates you. And this is something that the nafs also desires and will go after and will try to um, make it a part of, of its kind of daily repertoire uh, as much as it can. So they they point out these pitfalls uh, for one to be careful. That's why it's just safer. Either I'm going to say something good or I don't want to say anything at all. You know, and... Uh, we live in a culture now, especially with the proliferation of social media, and that has been, especially now in this coronavirus, COVID-19 sort of uh, lockdown, and, and people now probably even communicating more on social media than they even did before, which is quite a bit. Uh, so there is this general culture of I need to, you know, state my opinion and comment about things and, you know, offer my commentary about this event or that event or, you know, this particular uh, conspiracy or that particular thing. You know, just yesterday, you know, or the day before yesterday, I think, um, one of my teachers, uh, he had kind of given a very you know, academic but very scholarly lecture about um, the uh, the proliferation or the, the, the Arabic language being the lingua franca of, of knowledge for a long part uh, of our collective civilizational history. You know, now, so... Now it's English, but one can make an argument that less than a thousand years ago it was Arabic, and even Europeans were learning Arabic uh, in order to have access to um, you know books that were only available in Arabic, and then they'd be translating them to Latin. So the main book of, of medicine, in fact, the Qanun ibn Sina, uh, the Canon of ibn Sina of the Sana, uh, was originally in Arabic, obviously, uh, uh, al-Ra'is, as he's called and uh, translated into Latin. And that was up until probably the mid 19th century, the main kind of medical book, you know, kind of the Grey's Anatomy and more of, of the time uh, up until modern medicine. So yeah, and he gave like a scholar lecture about that. I didn't watch the whole thing, but I kind of watched bits and pieces. And then I saw people making comments on Facebook and this one guy wrote something like, I thought it was quite good. And then in broken Arabic, he's an Arab, but he's writing in broken Arabic. Uh, but I think the, Professor kind of, he has to be careful, but he said this and this, and I think it's actually this way. And, uh, you know, I care for any, it's actually like this, and shout ish. What is that? And he, uh, why, why did he feel that he, the need to offer his commentary? You can't even actually write the words properly. Uh, and there's rakaka. Uh, you can't, you don't even speak three of the words that the teacher actually spoke, but yet you felt compelled 
for the whole world to see you make your little commentary and offer your comments about that. And if I feel, if I look a little bit irritated about it, because I'm irritated about it, um, you know, they say that uh, 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 a setter or sumt is, uh, it's, a, it's a protection. Sumt is protection. Uh, to be quiet is a protection for you because then if you're actually ignorant, people will never know about it because you're quiet. So you don't have to ask. And there's a, a popular uh, story that goes for Imam Abu Hanifa who they had one of his students and they were studying fiqh and they were studying about uh, uh, prayer times and he was saying that uh, uh, that Salat al-Maghrib then becomes uh, obligatory uh, after the setting of the sun uh, and then one of his students that Abu Hanifa up until that time was impressed with because he was silent and he looked like he was absorbing everything and, you know, looks very smart and intelligent. He said something like, well, uh, uh, you know, what, what if the sun doesn't set? How do we pray Maghrib then? Something like that. So, <laughs> yeah, he I said, okay, maybe it was better for you to stay. <laughs> Don't say anything next time. <laughs> stay silent. Yeah, he, uh, so, uh, choosing silence uh, is uh, also in terms of having a reaction to things. It's a motive, you know, it, it's a position, it's a valid position to say uh, purposefully, I'm not going to say anything, you know, or I'm, you know, and that was the motive of Sittina Maryam, alayhi salam, right? She, she, there's nothing she could have said that would have convinced uh, uh, the uh, Bani Israel of her time after she comes down from the temple. And she had a baby within probably an hour or something like that, or minutes. Uh, and she's carrying the baby in her arms. And even the people said to her, You know, you brought this, how can we explain this? You were dedicated to the temple and Zachariah was watching over you. How did this happen? Your father was not a bad man and your woman uh, was not a prostitute. Your, your mother was not a prostitute. Literally, that's what they said. So before all of that, she said, I will not speak to uh, anyone. I have made a vow, an oath of silence to my Lord, so I'm not going to talk to anybody. And then she came to her people. All she could do is, She pointed to the baby Jesus in the cradle, and then the first words out of his mouth was, Inni Abdullah. Atani al Kitab wa Ja'alani. That's it. What could they say after that? I am the, I am a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've been given the book, I've been given the hikmah. He has made me a prophet. He did not make me um, rebellious against my mother. He made me a Mubarak person and peace upon me the day that I was born and the day that I am I die and the day that I'm resurrected. So sometimes it's good. Uh, in fact, I think oftentimes, um, especially now when there's a lot of cross talk and talking heads and everybody has an opinion about something, uh, you don't have to have an opinion about everything. And uh, you need not, uh, even if you do have an opinion about something, you need not share it. It's not necessarily necessary you have to think okay is this going to be in the category of khair of good or should i choose the other option which is sumt how they will see it in nabi sallam that's what the prophet sallam said either it's good or khalik samt or don't say anything so you have to determine that and then there are some things to help you determine that well is the thing i'm going to say is it true or is it not true am i really sure about it i'm not so sure about it um is it going to have a good effect on the people that who hear it from me or might they take offense or might they uh, be injured by it somehow words have value and words are deeds too that's also a, a cardinal principle words are deeds and they have an effect on others so we don't say oh it's just words no it's not just words 
uh, words have an effect. This, these books we're reading are words. The Quran is words. You want to tell me words don't have an effect? Words can can change the world, and this is something uh, uh, a unique thing to the human condition that we've been given words. We can express thoughts in words, so it's really an expression of what could be even your innermost being of your sir. So, Sir Abdul Qadir Jilani, as we know, when he came to these majalis, he didn't have notes as his students mentioned, and he didn't have like a notebook in front of him, he wasn't reading from a book. So this really was Fathul Rabbani wa Faid Rahmani. This is what Allah Taala has opened his heart to. وَأَفَاضَ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْمَعَانِ وَالْفَيْدِ الرَّحْمَانِ Fayd means like a deluge uh, that came from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So this will see of the Shaykh, yeah, I need to, um, you know, be concerned with your your inner state, and yes, your outer state actually you're concerned with it, is so as not to injure other people, right? That's why the concept in the Deen is. And hey'a, how you look from the outside, you know, not smell bad and, and to wear clothes that are uh, non-offensive. It's you're not actually dressing for yourself, you're dressing for other people. But not so that you may impress them, but the minimum so that you don't bring any harm to them. And then we read earlier, uh it was this class or another one, Khulu Zina to command the Kulli Masjid. The ayah al Quran, take your zina in every masjid, you know, take your adornment. So that has a uh, a literal meaning, like, to, like when you go, especially to the mosque, the Bayt of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wear something reasonable, right? Um, uh, not your skinny jeans that when you bend over, then everyone can see uh, your aura, and, uh, you know, not a shirt with images on it that's going to be you know, any, uh, distracting to the musadleen, but could take your zina at that place. And then also, if the heart is a masjid, well, qalbu baytul rabb, Right, it's a temple of God. Then also, make that muzayyan, make it adorned inside of you. Don't have any najasat, right? Don't have any impure things. So impure thoughts, it's like najas. It's like you have your masjid and musalla, and you have garbage dumped over here, and you know you walk the dog, but he didn't get a chance to get outside, so he took his dump over here, and you know you have things strewn all over the place. Who's going to want to pray in that masjid? Same thing. Who's going to want to look at the heart? that is full of these najasat, and these najasat and uh, ma'nawiyya. So, haqd, karahiyya, hasad, you know, all these things of uh, jealousy and hatred and, you know, shamata, wanting to see bad things happen to you, the people you don't like. These are all najasat. They're impure things. They're amral qalbiya. Wal qalb mahal nadhar illah. In Allah yandhur ila qulubukum wa amalukum. Allah is looking at your heart. So you think you're going to be inspired? You're going to find an inspired state when it's full of all that stuff? How could it be? They, they don't mix, right? If you have a garden and you want your garden to be beautiful, but you have all these weeds growing in it and you have all this garbage strewn over it, you can plant as many rose bushes as you want, but people are not going to see the rose bushes. They're going to see a litter strewn garden that doesn't have anything that's very... Um, enticing or, or beautiful in it because you can't see it via all of the garbage that's true that's why the ulama describes this process as takhliya thumma tahliya uh, thumma tajliya so takhliya means to remove these impurities so these spiritual impurities thumma tahliya which is to then adorn it with uh, the beautiful character traits the beautiful attributes so after you've kind of raised the garden got rid of all the weeds, uh, but not using Roundup, right? Not using a poisonous way to do that, but a pure way, you turn the ground, right? Roundup is a fast track, uh, poisonous way to get rid of your weeds, right? But then you destroy the soil underneath. We don't want to destroy our hearts. So there's no like necessarily quick fix or quick route to doing that. You have to turn the ground, right? And turning the ground means mujahadat. So if you're looking for the fast way, fast track way to get rid of all these things, it's not really exist. You employ your Lord, you beseech him, you uh, put your head down on the, on the musalla in sujood and, you know, with the most sincere of intentions in your heart, plead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to lift these burdens from upon you, these nafsaniyat, turn the ground. So mujahadat, wake up in the middle of the night, wake up early, at least for Fajr. Fast the days, even outside of Ramadan. Uh, bite your tongue when you want to say something that 
back to your mom, you didn't like what she said, or your dad, or your, your siblings, or your spouse. Hold yourself. So we do these mujahadat, turning the ground, and you see that when you turn the ground, it becomes ready for the seeds to be planted. Now it has an acceptance. In Allah and Qulubuhum Min Ajili. Allah SWT is with the brokenhearted for my sake. So the brokenhearted for my sake are those who have turned this ground, right? And now they feel bare and maybe vulnerable, and but the cup is now empty, right? Don't come with a full cup. Don't come with your arrogance and don't come with, um, you know, this sort of, uh, I, I believe I'm a gift to the humanity sort of attitude, but come empty with the empty cup and Allah will fill it for you. Allow Allah to fill it for you. Then the seeds can be planted. Then they begin to grow. Then you irrigate them. Right now, there's a process of tahliya. You water it. You maintain it. There's siyana. There's upkeep, so forth. And then the trees begin to build their roots. And when trees build their roots, weeds don't come back. Right Now that, that ground has been claimed by the true tree. Al-shajar al-tayyibah. Right? Kal-kalim al-tayyibah. Right, the shajal al-tayyibah, the good tree is firmly planted, it's like the good word. And then its asl, its root is in the ground, and then its furua, its branches, go to the sky. And as we know, uh, a tree literally can keep growing and growing and growing. You know, I've been to the uh, uh, sequoia forest in uh, Northern California. They, they're like, I don't know, hundreds of years old or more, and they can keep growing and growing, and literally they're like skyscraper-like size. And so when the good tree is firmly planted, then they can keep growing and, 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 and growing and you know bear fruits and, and so forth. And so at that point, um, uh, it's planted. The weeds don't come back. And people look at it in awe. And maybe they didn't see the turning of the ground in the beginning, and they didn't see how the roots were planting themselves and going on and, and stretching out, but now they see the finished product. And so the believer is kind of similar. You have to turn the ground. You have to be a mujahid uh, against your nefs. So I kind of did the long commentary there, but inshallah, yeah, there's some benefit. There's another thing I want to read before maybe we kind of wrap it up. which I think is an important concept. He says, uh, the next page, Ya Ghulam, young man, Iyaka, Iyaka. Before that, well, let's read that. Iyaka, Iyaka, and Tunazia, Mahzuzan, Finnahu, Yaslamu, or Yartafa, or Enta Tahlak, انتظر كشفه عنك ولا تيأس فإن من ساعة إلى ساعة فرجاء كل يوم هو في شأن ينقل من قوم إلى قوم اصبر معه ورضى بتقديره فإنك لا تدري لعل الله يحدث بعد ذلك أمرا إذا صبرت خفف عنك البلاء وأحدث لك أمرا يحبه وتحبه وإذا جازعت واعترضت ثقل عليك البلاء وزادك منه عقوبة لاعتراضك عليه سبب اعتراضكم عليه عز وجل من دعاتهم له وقوفكم مع نفوسكم وأهويتكم وأغراضكم وحبكم الدنيا وحرصكم على جمعها هذا كلام جامع جامع فصل So he says He says, uh, oh, young man, beware, beware, beware of quarreling with 
a lucky person, which I don't agree with that translation. Here in a mahzuz, al hazz means al hazz min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to say someone who has gotten uh, an allotment in life that is uh, appears to be mahzuz, yani appears to be something that is nice or good. So he says, beware of quarreling with such a person. And it's actually to naza, it's not to, not, not to physically quarrel with them, to naza, yani, to have an atirat, to have an objection in your heart, why them and not me? So you see someone has been given a particular lot in life and you say, why them and not me? So it says, for he will be saved and promoted, right? Yaslamu, wa while you will be wiped out, go down, suffer humiliation and be disgraced. How can you change his allotment by contesting it when his situation is predetermined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's foreknowledge? If you challenge al-haq, the Lord of Truth, over his foreknowledge concerning you and others, you will fall from his sight and your knowledge will be useless to you. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, toiling and weary, amilatun nasiba. You must repent right now to Allah, the innocent is clever. Do not turn back from aspiring to him on account of some trial he has inflicted upon you. Wait for it to be lifted from you, do not despair, for, for relief may come at any moment. Every day there is a sha'an. So every day, uh, some people will be raised, some people will be debased, some people will be given something taken away. So every day, you know, it's like the market. Every day it's going to be up and down for different people. So your up may be today, but your down may come tomorrow. And this, this, these tuqallubat, yani, this going back and forth is so you may turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's when you, then you have, you find a steadiness and you find your balance. What I can, you know, Aish, my tuqallubat, if you're just living with the ups and downs of every day, uh, you'll never be uh, tranquil, right? You, you won't have this tuma'nina. That's why the Quran says, Ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'inna al only by the dhikr, only by the remnants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will you find tumainina, will you find this peace that you're looking for. He transfers things from one set of people to another. You must be patient with him, with Allah, and willingly accept his ordainment, his taqdeer, because you do not know. It may be that Allah will afterward bring some new thing to pass. Right? That's usually the case. If you are patient, he will alleviate your misfortune and bring about a new state of affairs, one that is to his liking and also to your liking. If you are impatient and uncooperative, however, he will cause misfortune to weigh more heavily upon you. He will give you still more of it as a punishment for your obstructive attitude toward him. What causes your obstructive and contentious attitude toward him is your attachment to your lower selves, your nufus, your passions, your ahwaya, and your personal inclinations, your ghrad, your love of this world, and your greedy desire to amass what it has to offer. So, there's one thing also, uh, Sayyid Abdul Rahab al-Sharani, he said, this is true within ourselves, like if we have a misfortune that falls upon us, then know that there's a gharad, you know, there's a ghaya, there's a hikmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't look at that as a punishment, but look at it as a type of training. Allah's training me. Allah yu'addibuni, right? He's inculcating adab in me. And so, it's not about the thing that's befallen me, it's about what is the lesson I have to learn from it. Uh, and what do I take away from it? And then is it going to cause me to turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, or not? So that's true for ourselves. It's also true for other people, right? When even if misfortunes befall other people, yes, the one extreme is to be like shamata and be happy about the misfortune because you don't like them. Hada haram. The other extreme is to see the misfortune that befalls them and then fall into this sort of state of um, panic, not just panic, but uh, like, how can this happen? How can this happen to these people? And, you know, impossible. And what type of world is it? What is this world coming to? You know, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I, I don't think a Muslim should ever, ever utter that phrase or think it because the one who's in control of the world of the dunya is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so there should also be an istizan Yes, we should have ishfaq and we should be compassionate and, and so forth. But also keep in mind, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like the misfortune that befell you, Allah has a, a hikmah, a wisdom for it, maybe for that person too, right? And maybe there's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to get out of it that we don't see. So before we are so quick to judge and say, 
this shouldn't have happened and how can this happen and so forth, we should at least in our heart seek permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and istazinuhu, right, or seek his, uh, his approval like for me to wish some other state for that person. And so just like we seek that about ourselves, then we should also think about other people to maintain the balance. So yes, we'd be compassionate. And yes, we try. The Sharia is full of commandments to lift the afflictions from other people. And we do our best to afflict them. But here we're talking not about what we do with our limbs, but what we do with our heart. Right? Don't let your heart go that way to the degree that you have an objection to all of the misfortunes that are happening all over the place. Because that's the world, how Allah designed it. Uh, uh, it's the way he wants it uh, and for a wisdom that we can may not be able to understand so we'll stop here